Coleridge, the Aeolian harp. The Aeolian harp is one of what are usually referred to as Coleridge's conversation poems. That's to say it's written in a quite different style from other famous Coleridge poems like The Ancient Mariner and Kubla Khan, which have emphatic rhythms and musical rhyme patterns. These poems imitate a voice in quiet monologue or conversation like somebody speaking aloud more or less spontaneous thoughts. In fact, this effect is contrived, it's far from spontaneous, and that's clear with this poem because Coleridge rewrote it. He actually published three substantially different versions in 1796, 1803 and 1818. And he seems only to have realised a central element of what the poem is now regarded as meaning more than 20 years after he composed it. That's especially obvious in the copy displayed in the exhibition. In that, the poem's most famous lines about the one life within us and abroad, which connect human beings with the life of nature and perhaps through nature with the creator, appear as a last-minute addendum on an extra sheet pasted into the 1817 edition. The Aeolian harp of the title, named after the Greek god of the winds, Aeolus, is a sort of wind chime with strings. So it's an instrument made by human beings, but played by natural forces, the wind that sweeps across the strings. In the poem, the harp, as it is activated by the breath of nature, is associated first with a maid half yielding to her lover, then with the speaker, whose thoughts are as wild and various as the instrument sounds, and finally with all of animated nature, which is postulated as being in some sense like a huge harp played by the breath of God. The poem is addressed to Coleridge's wife, Sarah. The couple are imagined as sitting in their cottage garden at twilight as the sun goes down and the light changes and they are watching the scene with a sort of passive receptivity. The breeze, the breath of nature, strikes the harp. This prompts a series of more or less heterodox religious reflections which Coleridge first hears in the sound that is present and then connects with other times when he has been passively receptive to nature. In each version of the poem, he hears in these experiences religious meanings, but these religious meanings are given more definition and perhaps made more hetero heterodox by the lines about the one life within us and abroad, added in 1817. When Coleridge's ideas about the divine become unorthodox, Sarah frowns at him. He accepts the validity of her reproof and says how important it is to ground your thinking about religion in real experiences of the divine, as he is in fact doing when he listens to the harp. So the poem describes a mystical religious experience of nature prompted by the sound struck by the wind from the harp and entertains the idea that this animating breeze is analogous to the breath of God, an intimation of a kind of universal divine presence. What if all of animated nature be but organic harps, diversely framed, that tremble into thought as o'er them sweeps plastic and vast, one intellectual breeze, at once the soul of each and God of all. Plastic there meaning, of course, giving them shape, a creative force. Some readers, I should say, think that the poem doesn't hang together very well, especially the poem as altered by the lines added in 1817, 
because while these are excellent in themselves, they are the result of what Coleridge in the poem says religious thinking should be, faith that inly feels, and so such readers feel Coleridge ought not to accept his wife's reproof about them. It's quite a long poem, just over 60 lines, and the tone of interior monologue or implied dialogue searching to articulate emotionally powerful but intellectually subtle intuitions means, I think, that it needs to be read quite slowly. Here it is. The Aeolian Harp My pensive Sarah, thy soft cheek reclined thus on mine arm, most soothing sweet it is to sit beside our cot, our cot o'ergrown with white-flowered jasmine and the broad-leaved myrtle, meet emblems they of innocence and love, and watch the clouds that late were rich with light, slow, saddening round, and mark the star of eve serenely brilliant such should wisdom be, shine opposite. How exquisite the scent snatched from yon bean field, and the world so hushed, the stilly murmur of the distant sea tells us of silence. And that simplest lute placed lengthwise in the clasping casement. Hark, how by the desultory breeze caressed, like some coy maid half yielding to her lover, it pours such sweet upbraiding as must needs tempt to repeat the wrong. And now its strings boldly are swept, the long sequacious notes over delicious surges sink and rise, such a soft floating witchery of sound as twilight elfins make when they at eve voyage on gentle gales from fairyland, where melodies round honey dropping flowers, footless and wild, like birds of paradise, nor pause, nor perch, hovering on untamed wing. Oh, the one life within us and abroad, which meets all motion and becomes its soul, a light in sound, a sound like power in light, Rhythm in all thought and joyance everywhere. Methinks it should have been impossible not to love all things in a world so filled, where the breeze warbles and the mute still air is music slumbering on her instrument. And thus, my love, as on the midway slope of yonder hill I stretch my limbs at noon, whilst through my half-closed eyelids I behold the sunbeams dance like diamonds on the main, and tranquil muse upon tranquillity. Full many a thought, uncalled and undetained, and many idle flitting fantasies traverse my indolent and passive brain as wild and various as the random gales that swell and flutter in this subject lute. And what if all of animated nature be but organic harps, diversely framed, that tremble into thought as o'er them sweeps plastic and vast, one intellectual breeze, at once the soul of each and God of all. 
But thy more serious eye a mild reproof darts, O beloved woman, nor such thoughts dim and unhallowed dost thou not reject, and bids me to walk humbly with my God. Meek daughter in the family of Christ, well hast thou said, and holily dispraised these shapings of the unregenerate mind. Bubbles that glitter as they rise and break on vain philosophies, I babbling spring. For never guiltless may I speak of him, the incomprehensible, save when with awe I praise him, and with faith that inly feels who with his saving mercies healed me, a sinful and most miserable man, withered and dark, and gave me to possess peace and this cot and thee, heart-honoured maid.